There are problems here that we have to face. In the first place, on the level of causation, we are dealing with matters that can only be presented symbolically. Actually, the purpose of most of your great cosmological systems is to create an internal picture, a mandala, a meditation image, which the individual must unfold according to the capacities of his consciousness at any given time. Therefore, we are not dealing with problems such as a map of the city of Los Angeles, where each step of the way can be examined and checked. We are dealing with great abstract conceptions. And these conceptions in their turn change in meaning as we grow. We think we have them solved. But our own unfoldment is forever challenging us to search more deeply into this basic mystery which underlies all things. So we are dealing with truth or principles in a mystery. And words fail, thoughts fail. But perhaps out of the effort to grasp we release from ourselves something of the archetypal design. For the most part, these abstract subjects are profitable to us only in one way, that they increase our confidence or understanding about the kind of a universe in which we live. They help us to find more solid footings for faith upon laws and principles, which partly understood still blaze out in splendor, giving us an assurance that we live not in an accident, but in a great intention. Probably that is the largest lesson that we can immediately learn. For well, the details of this intention have been theological controversies since the dawn of time. Yet each individual gradually outgrows both the theology and the controversy. He finally comes to see the experience of the great creative processes within himself. He is aided in this because he is a miniature of all things. In an orderly universe, creation occurs on numerous levels, and these levels, in a concatenation, that is, in a descent from higher to lower, these levels follow the same archetypal pattern, and if the trestle board can be sensed or grasped at least in part, it supplies a useful key to the innumerable particulars which may be of concern to us. There is an ancient belief or doctrine concerning septenary which I think may be abstractly useful. Some of our most remote ancestors in the great philosophical schools declared that the whole of cosmos, the entire vast universal system of universes in which we exist, is built upon a vast mathematical formula. Whether we want to say that the formula came first, or the universe blazed this formula into existence, perhaps is a fine point. But one thing we do feel or believe that is sustained by the deepest knowledge that we have, namely, as Plato says, God geometrizes. The creating power, whatever we wish to designate, 
manifesting its own nature according to its own will, moves inevitably in a patterned way, in an orderly way, in a way suitable to the gradual unfoldment of a system of emanations, all of them orderly, consistent, and proper. Also according to this ancient belief, the differentiations of universal systems, of cosmic systems, and of solar systems, this differentiation was due to basic formulas contained within the great formula. Therefore, every creation, every solar system, and everything created within it is determined by a basic formula unique to each structure. Thus, the formula which manifests itself in our creation defines both the creator and the creation. And another creation, another system, may emanate from a different formula. This formula determines the pattern, determines the type of life, the growth, the motive, and the end. And this formula in turn is dependent upon an infinite pattern of formulas which together form the master plan of all. In our subconscious human thinking and in our racial experience, in our psychology, philosophy, and religion, we have always accepted the peculiar sacredness of the number seven. And we are therefore impelled to assume that the key number upon which our entire solar life unfolds is a pattern based upon the esoteric powers and significances of the number seven. This is why Septenaries of various kinds are eternally present because from the basic archetypal trestle board, from the master plan, all things infinitely re reproduce themselves in kind so that everything within the creation bears witness to its master key. And this master key for us, for our creation, the ancients declared to be a septenary, an unfoldment of all things through the mystery of the number seven. Now this mystery itself can intrigue us for an incredible period of time. I have seen magnificent calculations built upon it, vast patterns unfolding through it. But for our purpose, uh, in the time that we have, we cannot attempt uh, to trace all of this material. We will trace certain phases of it. But our principle rests upon the ancient conviction that the archetypal pattern of this solar system is septenary. And therefore, that this septenary power is the geometrical energy of the creating principle as it relates to this creation and to all of the parts that manifest within this creation. Now, in a previous discussion, we attempted, from a Buddhistic standpoint, to define the nature of consciousness in relationship to what we term mind, or the illusional intellectual fixation. And we remember that Buddha considered sleep to be the most approximate symbol of consciousness, and that it is from this mysterious root, this unconditioned state, into which the sensory perceptions and the aggregates or hindrances of illusional activity all retire, that in this basic state of not being objectively aware is a type of consciousness which survives without action, survives without self-knowing, survives without imparting knowledge. 
and that this consciousness furthermore possesses within itself the power to awaken itself into objectivity from the mystery of sleep. Thus sleep carries within it certain rhythms, certain habits, natural and inevitable to itself. And the individual desiring to awake at a certain time the next morning will awake, although he is not conscious of the circumstances that caused him to awaken. The continuity of this purpose was carried through what we call unconsciousness to be revived again when the need arose. This same principle corresponds to certain very early Asian teachings. For here we find the statement in the standards of Zan or standards of contemplation or meditation that the eternal parent wrapped in its seven mysterious and invisible robes slumbered again for seven eternities. And we also learn that time was not for it lay asleep in the infinite bosom of duration. Universal mind was not, for there was no vehicle to contain it. Now this represents then the sleeping world, or the sleeping state of root consciousness. We have already pointed out that this problem, the innate nature of consciousness itself, we cannot fathom. We do not know the consciousness as it is, in abscondita, without manifestation, without self-awareness, but simply existing. Yet in the ancient system, all things that were fashioned, all things that were emanated, all things that were created, emerged from the inscrutable mystery of the eternal state of consciousness, which we liken to sleep. Therefore, that in the praleas or the great nights of the gods, things sleep. And in the uh, dawn of new cycles of manifestation, things awaken. Waken as we do, out of the mystery of an eternal law which preceded sleep. For all creation as we know it is re-creation. All manifestation as we know it is an emergence from non-manifestation, which in turn was preceded by manifestation. And as the universe is itself a vast unfolding thing, sweeping like a huge population through space, we are also confronted with the mystery of life around us as we see it. Living things are forever being born and forever dying, but life is forever going on. Humanity is composed of an infinite number of perishable beings, that is, as far as their external natures are concerned. Yet humanity has a strangely imperishable quality about it, for it goes on to a constant process of recreation. All human beings coming into birth in the daily existence we know are not born at the same time. Some are born while others are old. Uh, some are born and others die. Some are born nearly at the same time. But there is forever a morning and forever a dying, and yet the vast body of life goes on. Such is the mystery as it emanates from space. There are worlds coming out of space. There are worlds existing in space. There are worlds disappearing in space. But space itself, an eternal principle, is never empty of creations, never without something emerging or something departing something coming forth or something retiring. The suns and planets and great systems are forever being born, forever fulfilling their destinies and forever returning again to the mystery of sleep, to the mystery of infinite, absolute causation. And this timeless, dimensionless, ageless thing 
which can never die because it knows neither birth nor death, but within which is an infinite capacity of mourning and dying, of forever awaking, so that it appears as though every germ which floats in this mystery can be touched for the fire of creativity and burst into a world, and that having passed its proper span, it fades back into the mystery from which it came. And in the back of the great meditation image, then, of your creative processes is this vast concept of an eternal potential, forever producing potencies, an eternal principle, forever flowing into um, manifestations that are temporal or non-eternal. But the, the one foreverness in the whole pattern being this forever of livingness which comes into manifestation forever. Now some systems have assumed that at the very root and source of the totality is an infinite form of this vast uh, pre-conceivable thing, this thing that simply cannot be known because totality cannot be grasped by parts. The totality knows its parts, but they do not know it. So the universe is infinite capacity, always being filled with infinite potential, and going on and on and on. So the first power of the ancient Godhead was this resident simple fact of consciousness itself, which may have a pre-existence existence in its nature, a consciousness represented as consisting of two states, one a state of eternal sleep and the other a state of non-eternal awaking, so that consciousness never fully awake. Consciousness never fully sleeps. Yet consciousness is forever both sleeping and waking. Consciousness as itself, per se, is the infinite root of life. And therefore it has been declared to possess within it the slumbering power of the first manifestation of its own nature, and that is infinite creativity. So at the root of every great system of theology is the Creator, and the Creator is the potential to make known, to make manifest, uh, to make apparent, to bring forth out of sleep into waking. Now in most of your great systems, the creative act, the primary creation, the speaking of the eternal word or verbum, that which causes the break in the mysterious chain of sleep, that which disturbs the sleeper into waking, the divine fiat, is associated with the creative power. And once this power has struck, the light has come, creation has been objectified, we find very, very little further reference to this power. This power then simply rests as the infinite storehouse, the infinite source of all things that are ultimately to be made manifest. Therefore, in most theologies, you find very little actual definition, very little explanation, uh, very little even veneration uh, for this principle in itself. Now we will find, for instance, throughout the world, temples to many deities, but there are very few temples to the simple principle of universal consciousness itself. In Christendom, for example, you will find very few churches dedicated to God per se. You will find deity worship through attributes, but symbols 
of absolute deity. Uh, churches, temples, or shrines in honor of this absolute deity are comparatively rare. When you compare the number of churches, for example, in Christendom that are dedicated to Christ, you do not find nearly so many in which the dedication is directly to the first power of the Godhead. This first power of the Godhead is always represented as a strangely aloof power, bringing things forth and then remaining in the shadow behind them. Now we have many symbolisms to represent what might be termed the dawning of consciousness, the first creativity in this great emanational theater. In Taoism and in Zen, for example, the primary symbol of creation is a circle. Now this is perhaps contrary to our more common concept. For we nearly always think of the creating power first as a being. In your esoteric and philosophical systems, however, a being is not the first. Being is the first. And therefore the circle, as a symbol of infinity, represents to the mind of the symbolist, as a mandala, an infinite field of consciousness. A field infinite as far as we can conceive, and yet in the background of the vaster systems, of which this is but a small fragment, a restricted or limited field. It is, however, the peculiar zone, area, or field, which is to become involved in the creation of a system of some kind. And in antiquity, uh, the supreme being uh, in nature, universal consciousness, was usually considered as an area. It was considered as a diffusion, as an infiniteness with its center everywhere and its circumference nowhere. And strangely enough, uh, this consciousness, which represents actually the field of creativity of a logos, or deity, was a circle, or more correctly, a sphere. But the sphere diagrammatically becomes a circle, which is, which is a symbol of a very abstract quality representing an area impregnated with a consciousness or with a life principle. The first power or the first principle therefore in symbolism was usually represented as defined as a circle, a great area set aside for germination, for the generation of worlds the ring pass knot, the shell of the mysterious world egg within which the fecundation of life is to take place. This is Atma. This is the superior nature. This is consciousness without the implication of selfhood. Consciousness without self-consciousness. Existence in a kind of trance-like sleep, permeating, penetrating, extending, but not yet focused or drawn to any particular point, because it is everywhere. Now, Bailey, the German mystic, attempts to help us with this thinking through his own mystical speculations and visions. And he explains that in this vast area, which is actually the body of the creating principle, undifferentiated, but nevertheless there, as in a mysterious alchemical vessel, a circular globe with walls of glass. Within this, the great alchemy of creation unfolds. And this alchemy is primarily made possible through the second principle or power of the basic creative triad. And this second power the ancients sometimes referred to as formation. Now, formation is the root of form, and form is a kind of condition. 
Form and matter are not the same. Form is always a compound. For a form must possess at least two attributes, two natures, two substances, or a principle and a substance. It must be less than totality and more than the condition inferior to itself. Thus formation, which was what the Kabbalists sometimes referred to this situation, was the process of bringing forth not upon a level of generation, but upon the level of consciousness. Generation upon the level of consciousness, the ancients conceived to be formation, or structures brought forth, as the Hindu says, by will and yoga. And by formation in this process, Bainey explains that there is a vast motion, a motion that moves along a radius, and that this motion is from the circumference of the vast circle of life to its center. Gradually, all of this field moves toward its own center, leaving behind it what the ancients called privation. And Bailey refers to when he says, this and abyss, the abyss being that which is left and the gradual bringing together or moving together of the spiritual energies of an area results in these energies moving toward a center, leaving behind them an area privated of their own natures. And this privated area becomes the basis of what we call matter. Now matter is not the absence of life, but the life deprived of certain attributes, the creative attributes, which have been drawn to the center. Matter is just as much alive as anything else in space, but certain consciousness intelligence factors have been drawn toward the center along these radial lines from the circumference. And when they unite in the center to form the dot in the circle, we then have the gradual emergence of the third logos, or the third power of the creating principle. And this third power was called by the ancients the universal thought. Now, how shall we fix this thought perhaps a little more adequately in our mind? Consciousness is superior to thought. Therefore, thought can come into existence in consciousness. Now, less than consciousness, but more than thought, is something else for which we need a word. And uh, the scriptures give us one word that is uh, applicable. It is something uh, that is a little more and, uh, than thought, but less than consciousness. <coughs> And one word that has been suggested for it is understanding. Understanding being a power which can transcend thought. It is good to under it is good to think, but it is better to understand. But it is still better to be fully conscious. These things represent degrees. Now, in your great uh, group of uh, creative principles, we have then. This triad of the Platonists, the one or the eternal, the beautiful, the understanding, and the good, which is the, great, the divine thought. We also have, therefore, creation moving through an understanding from within itself towards the integration of primary thought. Now, thought is an interesting point, because in your esoteric doctrine, thought is not a product of mind. Mind is a product of thought. Mind proceed, it follows thought. It does not precede it. The eternal thinker brings into existence an infinite diversity of minds which become the channels of the eternal thought. But the mind does not come first. The thought comes first. The thought is universal. The mind is finite. 
The thought represents the series of archetypal ideas that are resident within the divine nature itself. Thus we have creation moving through formation into the establishment of the focal point of generation. Thought therefore becoming a symbol of generating power. A formation becoming a symbol of the processes of universal understanding. Creation being the manifestation of the infinite life itself according to its own inevitable nature. Thus we have a triad now which constitutes the three basic principles of existence. This triad returns to us in every line of thought, every religion, every philosophy. But it represents three essential natures, a symbol of the primary colors of life. And we find references to these in medieval philosophy, in the treatises and essays on the colors of good and evil, the colors of light and darkness. And of course the color symbolism which was very important throughout religion and uh, is still very important in the vesture of the clergy and things of that nature. The triad then consists of a gradual retiring of all things from their vast circumferential area towards the ultimate establishment of a point of unity. All moving toward the state of oneness. Oneness emerging from allness. Oneness becoming an imperishable island in the midst of allness. We find this in the Kojiki in Japan, where the gods caused the abyss to release this imperishable mud land by dipping their spears into the infinite and bringing them up with this elus or slime on the point. And this formed an island on the surface of the sea of the infinite. So here was the sea of the infinite uh, in the Japanese uh, basic Shinto religion as creativity itself. The gods representing the formators, the great units of understanding. And the island brought up upon the point of their spheres the universal thought upon which all things uh, were to be erected. The universal thought is therefore, we will say, the least of the three great principles. Yet into it has been gradually drawn or focused these potentials. And we now have uh, what the Kabbalists call uh, Kethor, the crown. First the closed eye of the infinite, and finally the eye that blazes open. And we have creation going to sleep when the great eye closes. And we have it awaking when the great eye opens. The eye, of course, the pupil of the eye, is very symbolically a dot in a circle. So that it represents the symbol. And for the creating power itself, the Kabbalah removes the eyelid. Because it is stated in the scripture, the God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So this great open eye is the symbol of the universe blazing forth. It is the all-seeing eye. But it exists as deity upon the level of universal thought. Behind universal thought, which is the Manasa principle, monastic field of Buddhism, lies the second or mysterious Buddhic level, which is that of understanding or in the term of man, illumination. Behind that is Atma, the eternal, that which can know only itself, and to which all things must return, either by the long road of evolution, or by the shorter path of discipline. For discipline is nothing but evolution under the control of intelligence or enlightenment. So we have three powers now uh, represented, and here we must pause for a moment in our study of this septenary. We have begun with Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. We have come to the monastic field, which is the field of the great thoughts. 
Now, how shall we understand this thought? How shall we understand the non-eternal thought of the eternal thinker? What is this thought, actually? How shall we attempt to define it, other than to say that it is a great center, a great radiating focal point for a creation that is to emerge from it, and therefore that the focal point between creator and creation is this mysterious vortex of thought. This vortex of thought is the third grand master of the Lodge of Jerusalem. It is the third power, it is the master builder. It is the power upon which depends the entire emanation of a world or an existence or a creation. Now this thought itself in Indian philosophy is usually represented by a mendicant, sometimes by the deity Shiva. Usually, however, it is represented by a being in manifestation, but also in meditation, performing either the Vedantic or yogic mystery. For we come now to what might become the basis of either Hindu or Chinese uh, mentalism, and which probably underlies most of the mentalistic sects that have arisen among Western people. Namely, that creation in manifestation is entirely uh, a, a mystery of the release of thought. That this world as we know it, the manifestation, is built upon the mysterious cross thunderbolt of thought. This is a mental creation. It is a creation lying in the divine mind. And therefore, the ancients conceived it as an internalization. That actually, the creating power in a kind of yogic suspension, internal, visualized an existence, vitalized it and sustained it within its own consciousness. And your universe is a thought in the divine mind. It is a thought however, which perceives mind as we know it, existing in the divine nature, rather than in the human mind, as we are inclined to use the term. Again, our terms are difficult, unfortunate, and must sometimes be used in a contradictory manner because we have no other terms to use. Context alone can help us to keep the pattern straight. From then, let us see uh, where we are with our concept of the basic nature of the creation process. We now have the great seal, the Ungrun of Buddha, uh, of Bene. We have in the midst of it the blazing center of the divine thought. All this is invisible totally beyond our conception of things, for the sun and moon and stars as we know them have not entered upon the horizon of our conception. These things rest not in matter alone, but in superior worlds. And the visible sun, as Paracelsus tells us, is actually the third sun, and there are two invisible ones behind it. This also would carry the concept of the Godhead the great or first son, being the spiritual, the second, the Christ or illuminate son, and the third, the universal thought. But we think very often of the thought as something shining, the light of thought, the luminosity of the intellectual enlightenment that comes from the dawn of wisdom or reason within living things. The um, ancients and their astronomy also gave us an interesting point to remember. That the true sun is not in the center of the solar system, but the solar system is within the body of the true sun, which extends beyond the orbits of all its planets, forming a vast field of conscious life energy. 
and that is truly that this great sun is the one in which we live and move and have our being, and in the magnetic field of the human being, this corresponds to the auric egg, or the circumference of the electromagnetic field of the body. For in man, the consciousness is not in the body, but the body is in the consciousness. And the consciousness itself recapitulates this process, vocalizing to produce thought, but actually extending throughout the entire field. And therefore, perhaps paralleling the idea of Plato, namely that souls, lives, beings, falling into generations, come from the circumference of this great system and not from the center, and that suns and planets falling into generation fall from the Milky Way or the great embryonic field of stars, which the ancients regarded as a vast organism in space. But our purpose is merely to summarize this situation and to say that finally the great triad of invisibles, of causes, of principles, of divine attributes, this tri triad finally becomes manifested, not visible, but manifested through the first tangible thing with which we are capable of uh, struggling in an effort to understand, and that is universal thought. Now, universal thought is also something not imprisoned. Uh, the ancients said that the universal thought was azonic as its name implied that it was universal. Therefore, that all thought is a diminishing from this universal polarization. Thought is a unit. Thought is a oneness, extending again throughout the entire nature of existence. There is only one thought, although there may be an infinite diversity of thinkers. One thought sustains all mentality, all mental processes, and this thought itself is the luminous mind capacity of deity. It is the archetypal thinking, the thought, or the Hermes of the Hermetic axioms. For it is said that thought wrote all books, one thought producing all thinkers who in turn attempt to solve the mystery of ignorance and establish wisdom. So in the midst of a great field deprived by the energies which have been drawn to form this great focal point, blazes the invisible intellectual sun, the sun of thought. And now what happens? We have come into a situation that somewhat resembles an hourglass. We have brought the great creativity downward to a focal point in universal thought. From this focal point, it expands downwardly in quality, not in direction, but in quality, quality uh, descent. And what it does then is to begin to flow into the field that was left private by the reduction of energies as these were drawn to the center to form this great focal central luminosity. Therefore, thought begins to move inevitably into the privated area, moving inevitably over the area that was previously occupied by consciousness. But it moves upon a lower level than consciousness. It moves downward into objectivity as we know it. Now, there are many degrees of this and many processes of it, but for our simple purpose, let us assume, for example, that create, creation or created power was moved downward as through a funnel until it reached the bottom of the funnel, which was the focal point of thought. And then passing out of the funnel begins to diverge again to form the lower half of the hourglass in which it begins to flow into the field left deprived. But this field is now receiving an influx on a lower level than that from which it was originally deprived. So gradually the thought begins to fashion matter. 
it permeates matter and becomes the basis of something that uh, is to follow. And thought permeating matter sets up a twofold motion. This twofold motion uh, consists of the descent of the thought principle itself and as a result of the impregnation of matter by the universal thought energy, a gradual evolutionary process in matter. Matter begins to grow upward by the Gnostic doctrine of emanation. Matter begins to ascend to meet the descent of the light principles. And gradually out of this ascent of matter and the descent of energy, we find the rise of creatures. We find the growth and manifestation of all things. Now thought, having passed downward now into the uh, state of generation from which it is to operate, we have an important consideration held by our ancient brethren. First of all, that the mundane creation or the objective generation, whatever it may be, has its root in the universal thought. That it is an inverted tree growing downward to be met by another tree growing upward out of the abyss and that these two trees ultimately mingle their branches to form one tremendous structure. A structure of internal descending power and external uh, ascending power. These two meet on various levels and according to their degrees of meeting, on the levels on which they meet, species, types, kinds, worlds, planets, everything relating to the inner structure of a creation begins to come into manifestation. Actually, in the descent of this principle also, thought becomes the apex or the top point of the pyramid of generation. All things have their generating origin from thought. And man as a generating being ultimately becomes a mental or thought creator, but not as yet in his present evolution. Thought out of itself then also begins to develop objectively a new center of manifestation. And here in the monastic field, thought gradually identifies its first integration, and that integration is mind. Now mind is the body of thought, and mind and thought together constitute a compound. And this mind-thought compound becomes the upper point of what was called in antiquity the great square, or the symbolical figure which you may remember from ancient mythology of the triangle combined with the square and how the triangle falling into the square becomes the symbol of creation or generation on, a, on an objective or material plane. Now the square has always been the ancient symbol of matter. So we have three essential symbols involved in this. We have the circle or sphere which is the symbol of total consciousness. We have the triangle or pyramid, which is the symbol of the creative triad. We have the square or the cube, which is the symbol of the material creation. Spirit, soul, body. These three together. Of course, the principle being rather obvious, uh, that the circle or sphere is a symmetrical geometric body with an infinite number of faces, and that this rests upon the least point upon which any solid can rest, for there is no solid that can rest upon less of itself than a sphere, whereas the cube rests theoretically upon the greatest part of its own surface. The triangle rests upon a rather different basis because the triangle corresponds to an ascending line from below in the form of a pyramid or a descending arc from above in the form of the creative triad. 
All of this symbolism becomes a little confusing, but after a little thinking, I think it makes a reasonably simple picture. And the lowest of the creating principles, thought, meeting or working with the highest level of the creation or the deprived field, produces out of this union mind. The mind becomes then man's highest body and becomes the instrument most closely connected with universal thought. And through the mind and its evolution and development, the universal thought flows into objectivity, flows also into all the spheres of creation which are below mind. You will remember in the study of color that your three primary colors give rise to your four secondaries. Now, the peculiar situation of all four secondaries is that they are all of them composed of two or more primaries. Therefore, all of these things are forms, because form is a compound. Form, therefore, becoming into manifestation, is always a certain degree of thought plus a certain degree of matter. In man, the thought power transcends matter more than it does in the animal. And in the animal, the compound contains more thought than in the plant. The plant more than in the, in than in the mineral. But all these compounds of the thought and matter represent forms. Therefore, the square is called the universe of forms because within it, formal natures are forever being manifested. The square, therefore, contains the outworking of the three principles in their manifestation as four capacities. For well, the principles of the triad are forever flowing into the capacity of the cube square or uh, the lower formal structure. Now, in the case of man, these four represent the body principles. In the case of the universe, they represent the magnetic fields uh, which become uh, the foundation of the differentiation of energies. Thought, therefore, actually becomes the basis of the four bodies. And each one of these bodies is some kind of a condition of thought. Therefore, we may say that thought, or the thinking power, can understand them all. But they, in turn, cannot understand the thinking power. Thought can perhaps conceive mind. It has conceived it and brought it into being. But mind can never conceive the fullness of unconditioned thought. Because your meditational processes are attempts of mind to grasp the larger dimension of thought. A very complicated but interesting procedure. We have then a series of other creative powers emerging now from the thought principle. One of these we have said is mind. Now on the combination or in the field of mind, in the case of man and other creatures higher than man, the union of the thought and the mental field or energy of matter produces what we call in man the ego. And the ego becomes, so to say, the god of bodies. And this god of bodies is seated in the mental field of the, in, of the human being. And is there, it is this that causes man to verge inevitably toward mental attitude and to place the ego uh, above all other considerations. The ego-mind-thought compound is again a triad. For the thought becomes the first person, the mind becomes the second, and the compound of these thir uh, becomes the third, or the ego. The ego, in turn, is the generator, and from the generating power of the ego, the lower bodies are projected into existence. These lower bodies in the creative processes being unfoldments or manifestations of potentials being the power, for example, released through body, of emotion, or the power of growth, or the power of subsistence, which is the peculiar nature of physical matter. Thus we have, from the creative triad, the power 
to think, the power to feel, the power to grow, and the power to exist, temporally or physically, as an integrated compound. Now each of these things are powers. These in turn, including the power of subsistence or physical integration, which means a kind of energy that holds the physical body together, but is not the physical body. The power of sustaining a body, of substantiating it, depends upon a kind of energy which is called a binder. It holds. At death, this binder is removed. Therefore, the body disintegrates. The power to integrate, disintegrate, is a kind of energy also. So we have the power of thought, emotion, growth, and subsistence, or continuance in form. These constitute the quaternary, or the four secondary attributes, all of which also lie within the superior. But these four are definitely dependent upon thought and emerge from it. Therefore, to feel, to think, to grow, to subsist are actually under the power of the thought principle. Now when all these things are grouped together, we have seven basic powers, of which three are primary and four are secondary, but all together they are inevitably necessary in the compound which we call a solar system. And they are also necessary in the highest visible being that we know in that solar system, namely man himself. Actually, furthermore, we now have a human being without a body. We have his power to make one. We have his power to keep one, for time at least. We have his power to hold the atoms together, but we have no body. Because the ancients point out that body which is the substance or formal principle itself, in its lowest degree, is not a principle. Body is not a principle. Therefore, body was the eighth sphere of the ancients. Body is the grave. Body is the physical capacity. It is the cup into which all these energies flow. Body is, therefore, the great container of principles. And once these principles have been locked within the body, then the body becomes the symbol of this deprived matter, which I mentioned before. And all these principles moving into it begin to work through it. And in the universe or solar system, the body is composed of all of the physical members of that system, being the bodies of the planets and the luminaries. Therefore, the earth is part of the body of a solar system just as our own physical bodies belong to us. So seven principles flowing into a container or receptacle, which becomes both the tomb and the womb of these powers. It, they become, it becomes the tomb because in it these powers die, but the womb because from it these powers are reborn in the great evolutionary processes of nature. Thus we have the descent of the seven creative principles which are ultimately locked in matter. And being locked in matter, uh, they then begin the process of breaking through matter, which they do by a very gradual evolutionary process in reversal of the order of their descent. The Egyptian philosophers had a very interesting concept of that because they said that part of the, the, of the septenary came into every part of the formal principle and that the highest principle was reflected in the lowest as aspect or attribute of matter. Therefore, the ancient Egyptians said that consciousness per se in its physical existence in man, for example, exists in the skeleton, and it exists in the marrow in the bones. Then it therefore is associated with the most crystallized matter, forms itself into organization, 
subsistence is beginning. And wherever we find this, we also find the presence of geometrical law at work. Primary rudimentary forms from the radiolaria to the snowflake are all immediate geometric symbols. And this principle of subsistence, therefore, strangely ref reflects the great principle of universal consciousness, which is archetypal. Subsistence is continuance. And that which is eternity in spirit is continuance in matter, subsistence. Uh, matter is, and matter in some condition always is. Forms break up to return to matter, but matter absorbing all forms remains itself. Consciousness eternally is. All emanations of consciousness have a conditioned existence and finally return to it again. Consciousness, therefore, not only gives birth to the great invisible energies of life, but also must contain within itself the principle of form. All bodies return ultimately to consciousness. On the uh, mystery of causation, on the material physical level, all bodies coming from matter return to matter again. So, daemon as deus in versus, the superior and the inferior are reflections of each other. Matter claims all forms to itself. Consciousness claims all life to itself. Therefore, matter and consciousness have this peculiar inverted ratio to each other. Both are the polarizations of the same symbolism. Matter then becomes negative consciousness, and consciousness becomes a kind of positive matter. And these two symbolisms become the extremes of this great process. All compounds must be dissolved. Material compounds dissolve to matter. Sidereal or universal compounds dissolve into space or into consciousness. But the earth eats up everything that is of itself, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. And the positive pole eats up all of creation, ultimately including matter. So you have a symbolism that is very useful if you want to use it uh, to try to understand the difference between matter and space, for example, which has become very significant in the Einsteinian concepts. Space absorbs all things in a strange way and is a universal graveyard. Just as surely as uh, a forest lawn absor absorbs certain of our gentry and is a very fashionable resting place for that which is no longer held by substantial existence and is disappearing back into the strange abstraction of matter. So we have the, we have the mineral kingdom representing uh, subsistence. The mineral continues. Nearly all minerals can be broken into crystalline structures. They are all peculiar, simple manifestations of primordial energy. They, however, have an incredible subsistence and go on and on and on. They can be reduced by breakage. They can be uh, fractured by cleavage. Yet the parts remain, the parts remain, the parts remain. And when you come down to the least conceivable part, you still have the root of matter. It remains. These things may pass from visibility by fragmentation, but that which is material retires into a matter state uh, which, however, has a metaphysical aspect because behind matter is another kind of energy. There's no end to these ramifications, but for our purpose that's as far as we can go. Now the next point is that the power of growth or vitality uh, which contains within it also the power of color we find gradually emerging through the plant kingdom, in which universal vitality uh, breaks through the mineral existence 
of creating for itself first certain bridges, which we call lichens and things of that nature, and moving upward from the soft stones that hardened and the hard stones that softened, and finally producing a capacity for growth, a capacity for release. And we find coming out of the physical, the vital, in the form, of course, of the earth, where coming out of the earth itself is the infinite flora with which it is universally covered. Now in man, this vitality has certain physical symbolism, as for example hair, but it also has a, an invisible symbolism in the term of vitality, the power uh, to escape into action, the power to escape into generation. And the great power that is given by vitality is this power of gem uh, generation, which is represented by the seed pod, or represented by the power of these things, not only to subsist, but to reproduce their kind. This is done on the level of vital energy. Some of these vital forms have great endurance, as our Sequoia gigantea, that may live for six, seven thousand years. Others have a comparatively brief span of existence, but in each instance, vitality is breaking through matter, raising the form from the mineral to a vegetable state. Now, when emotion comes, this form is pressed on to the establishment of new function, and emotion manifests primarily in the animal world as motion. Emotion gives the power of the creature to move, and motion in turn is inspired by only one uh, quality, emotion, inasmuch as motion rooted in fear, rooted in the desperate effort to survive, to escape, to break away from things which might otherwise destroy. Dr. Biscayne made experiments a long time ago to prove that carrots and other vegetables have the rudimentary principle of emotion. And although this can only be measured by scientific method, the carrot tries to escape when something attempts to root it from the ground or break it or destroy it or eat it. This uh, form of life is beginning to experience the concept of survival. And through certain uh, links between kingdoms, such as the sensitive plant, in which the leaves of the plant actually attempt to escape the person who touches them and do move away, we find the gradual development of motion. And with it also emotion and the gradual release through the creature of the emotional potentials that we recognize. Now we also then find the motion from the emotional level to the next release of one of the creative principles, and this is the power of mind. We find the establishment of manas, or man, the thinker. We find him ascending through certain linked kingdoms, perhaps the anthropoidal group, we find him moving gradually toward the individual uh, control of his own destiny by the power of mind. And when man completes his mental evolution, the quadrature or the great hollow square which was formed in the creating process will be complete as far as he is concerned. The four secondary powers of the Godhead will then be incarnate. And what have they produced? They have gradually built a vehicle in which all of the lower vehicles still exist. Man, as a living creature, is not a mind that has discarded a body, but a mind who has, which has gradually come to control the mineral, plant, animal, and lower human attributes of itself. Now remember that man can only have emotion, or only have vitality, or only have uh, survival, or continuity, a subsistence, because these things exist also in space. He cannot have a, a, an emotion unless there is an emotion apart from him. He does not invent emotion. 
He does not create emotion. He creates integrations of vehicles by means of which these qualities from the universe can move into him. And whatever constitutes the highest integration which he is capable of receiving signifies the level upon which he functions. The animal has the emotional level sufficiently strong to receive and, and distribute emotional energy, but not yet strong enough mental organism to distribute mental energy. So the fact that man is developing these instruments and can see the four kingdoms around him, and in, including himself, indicates that these four kingdoms represent personifications or embodiments of powers which are existent in the solar system and must therefore also in some form be existent in every superior organism beyond the solar system, out into space itself. For nothing can manifest in any part of creation that is not an essential part of the ultimate creating principle itself. It must exist there. Therefore, that a mind exists in man means that a universal mind has to exist. That a universal mind exists means that a cosmic mind has to exist. And the cosmic mind implies that the great insular groups of cosmic systems must also have a mind. And that this mind retires infinitely on the level of mind to total mind. And every creature that possesses a mind is revealing or manifesting the attributes of the universal mentation factor, which is therefore a divine attribute. Now man having created these bodies also becomes uh, involved in a series of situations according to the ancient concept of the septenary. For man ascends like an ascending pyramid to an apex, and this apex becomes his mental nature. And at the point of mind, we have the bridge or the link between the universe of effects or of manifestations and the universe of causes. So man can ascend, according to the ancient concept, until he attains the state of mental existence. He can be a mind, a mind-ruling creature. And in his physical organism, the whole thing is repeated again, because in this case, he creates on the lower level another chain of these instruments, and the mind begins to function through the brain center. For man has not only participation in the thought of the universe, he has participation in the divine mind, and he functions as a mental being through a brain. And this complete stream of vehicles moves unbroken from its root to its ultimate manifestation. In the same way as the brain becomes the instrument of mind, so we know that the liver becomes the instrument of emotion. The spleen becomes the instrument of vitality, and actually the heart becomes the instrument of the physical body, therefore peculiarly linked with consciousness, which again is its opposite in the higher polarity. So that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So these various chains of vehicles form a study that can be continued almost indefinitely, but there is a tremendous pattern moving through them. But here we still have a situation. Man attains the development of mind, and by means of this, he becomes more and more proximate uh, to the level of the creative triad. Now, however, he is reaching the apex of the lower half of his hourglass again. He is now ascending through a series of instruments in which he is creating a capacity for the manifestation of the divine attributes. He has a compound personality now, and from this compound personality, regulated by the ego, seated in the mental field, he becomes a human being. Yet evolution for man does not stop at this point, because man now passes from the secondary or compound manifestations of the divine uh, principles to the higher triad. 
And this higher triad continues to require the development of other vehicles of manifestation. In a mysterious way, this triad has, in its negative poles, flowed into all of the body principles to make them exist and bring them up. Now, however, man has reached a point in which he can bridge, forming a tascaratus between the higher and lower structure. So we have the human being beginning to move upward onto a higher level of function. And we have man at this point in evolution, which is our particular place in the divine plan of things, it would seem, struggling with the combination of disentangling his various instruments from the tyranny and despotism of egoism. He has brought himself up to the point in which, as a mind-integrated being, he can make himself master of objectivity. As the ego itself, the ego turns downward and becomes the master of bodies. But the ego cannot go above its own level. Therefore, man is now standing, in more or less, at the point of equilibrium between a world of effects and a world of causes. He knows intuitively that he possesses within himself the capacity to go further. He knows also, if he studies these subjects in the spirit of the ancient teachings, that he has to go forward, and that he must continue to grow, because actually he is on his way not merely to self-existence, but to the unfoldment of the great septenary. And at this point of his development, he is very close to this mysterious line which divides the creative triad from the creation uh, quadrat or quaternary. So he's struggling now with this mysterious problem of the interval between ego, mind, and thought. Now, ego actually is a product of mind. Buddha points this out very clearly to us. Namely, that there is a kind of mind that is not egoic. That the ego is a self-created concept depending for its existence upon the attributes of the five senses or sensory instruments. Consequently, that this is an artificial entity and that mind lies behind it. Therefore, we have a great many philosophies in the world in which the individual tries in one way or another to discover what he calls divine mind. He tries to experience mind without self. And we find this in our meditational systems. The individual attempting to achieve through the renunciation of the focal point of selfhood. So we have the very concept of renunciation. For the individual, regardless of what he renounces in terms of worldly goods, no human being has anything important to renounce except his own ego, which is the cause of most of his troubles anyway. It isn't the poor worldly goods or chattel that he accumulates really has done himself or anyone else any harm. It's his own miserable misuse of these things through the tyranny of his ego. I, I want, I don't want. These things become the basis of egoism. So in your mystics, whether it's Christianity or non-Christian, you find the concept of unworldliness the breaking away, the giving up of worldly goods, the distribution of wealth among the poor, the retiral to the hermitage in the desert, the uh, sacrifice of worldly honors. Uh, we find these laws of unworldliness going as far as your monastic orders with their complete detachment from all things worldly, their, all, their laws of celibacy and continence and all these things. And this old concept that we've had from the beginning, that if it made us happy, it was bad for us, give it up. All of this is a struggle with the concept of the individual trying to break away from the peculiar hindrance 
which he recognizes in his own self-determination. His determinism to do as he pleases. And the recognition that in some way that this is not uh, what is supposed to be. That all of this leads not finally to the path of glory, but only to the grave. So in the individual, we find the gradual social emergence through the history of the race of principles that are essentially unselfish. We are not even sure we can define the word unselfish adequately. But we know there are degrees of selfishness, some of which are worse than others. And we try to proceed from the worst toward the better, leaving that behind which is no longer tolerable. But all of this is a motion away from ego, back into the integration of manas, or the pure principle of the thinker. Because your sage and your scholar has always taken the attitude that the true purpose of man is that he shall think. And that in order that he may think, he must conquer ulterior motive. Because no thought can be pure that is pressed upon him, forced upon him, or rises within him as the result of pressure or tension. Wherever the individual has an ulterior motive, he cannot think straight. And wherever he has an ego, he has an ulterior motive somewhere. It is almost inevitable. They go together, the little... The little thing itself is just plain ulterior, and you can't do anything to get away from it. Gradually, uh, the more wise of peoples have realized that you do not attain this end, however, by declaring war on the ego. Perhaps some have chosen a very interesting but a little difficult method. They have attempted to attain liberation by bewildering the ego. <laughs> by surrounding it with so many incomprehensibles that the poor thing is totally outwitted. That is not the answer either. The answer to the whole situation simply lies in the gradual recognition of values greater than the self. We find this escape, this release more correctly, therefore, to what we might term our great idealistic cultural motions. We find that the uh, early Christian, for example, valued his faith above his life and died in the arena. He put a principle above self. The patriot sacrifices his life and his worldly goods to free his nation, placing a common good above his own. The artist will go in poverty all his life, or the musician, perhaps like Mozart or Schubert, will come to an end through practical starvation or malnutrition in order to keep faith with great art, with great music, with great creativity. We find individuals who find creativity more rewarding than worldly acclaim and choose obscure and difficult fields or go out into some barren region to make it flower, simply because some spirit within them is stronger than the immediate satisfaction of their material natures. Thus mind gradually overcomes ego. And perhaps at the end of this overcoming of ego by mind, we have reason. Now reason is a peculiar word. Because to most people, reason sounds like a rather cold, calculating solution to, to the problem. But now let's go back to our formula for a moment, and here's just one simple little example of how you use it. Because actually, uh, many misunderstandings arise, because we do not recognize compounds. The reason of man, which is suspended above ego, verging toward the true nature of mind, must, by virtue of its creativity, partake of the divine consciousness, and it must also include within it the ascent of the emotional content of the personality. So that when we find what we call cold reason, uh, we merely find reason in which warmth has not been permitted to develop. Reason is not cold. Reason has no deficiency in the elements of divinity, uh, the developments of understanding, the developments of emotion or feeling. 
Reason must generate just as much as animals do. Reason must grow just as plants do. Reason must have a subsistence just as minerals have a subsistence. And reason must be thoughtful just as man is thoughtful. But it must be also creative, formative, and generative just as the creative triad is. Because all of these are locked within all the others. And reason must flower in all its aspects. The seven great principles must all blaze out of it, or it is not true reason. But true reason, now representing to us the a condition superior to egoism, brings us closer and closer to the mind nature. For the pure reason of the mind is, is just, is in all things reasonable, and orderly, and is an unfoldment of an absolute geometrical formula, therefore it must be beautiful, because all symmetrical geometric forms are beautiful, and all beauty as we know it lies in the reasonableness of things, so that reason should be something awkward, distorted, cold, is simply because human beings have thought of it that way, but those who have attained it have never found it to be that. So we can say that man escapes from selfishness by way of reason. He builds systems like ethics. He creates schools like philosophy. He goes further into the speculation of things in the effort to find uh, liberation from ego. And he discovers it in finding larger worlds in which to work. Worlds in which ego is not a medium of exchange. Worlds in which the products of ego are not the currency, but in which there are other treasures where thieves will not break in, uh, nor rust destroy. But having achieved even to the state of reason, man finds that he is still bound. So he goes further to explore the mystery of pure thought. Now those who have explored this mystery have actually reached the unity with the third power of the creative triad. They have moved from the quaternary into the triad. But what is pure thought? Pure thought is the generating power of consciousness. Pure thought is forever creating. It is creative thought. It is the type of thought which rises not in reason, but in something greater than reason. It is that thing which we call, perhaps, inspiration. It rises into the higher brackets in which thought in man, becoming tuned with universal thought, causes man to think with God and not about God. Think with his brother man and not about his brother man. Think with the universe and not merely think about the universe. So as the Eastern philosophers tell us, this at one moment of pure thought corresponds to attunement with the third person of the great triad of creative energies. And those who have solve this mystery of universal integration or attunement or at one moment have found the mystery of the Pentecost. They have found the mystery of the Holy Ghost or to what in Christendom is the third power of the triad. Now assuming that we have reached this point we know that we have gone about as far as man can hope to go. Because as yet, we are not aware of the nature of those vehicles which go or uh, completely transcend mental integration. Yet we know, however, that the next vehicle which lies behind that is what the Buddhist calls the buddhic sheath. Now the buddhic sheath represents the second power of the Godhead. Coming into the concept, therefore, we call formation. 
or the motion of consciousness towards center. But now we are radiating outward instead of going inward. Involution was the gathering of these things. Evolution has brought us finally to the dot in the center of the circle and we must now move out into the radius. This means universalization. This means the individual moving irresistibly from a state of objective oneness to a state of subjective allness. He is therefore forced to move away from himself as a person and towards himself as a cosmic principle in space. Selfness in the sense of gradual identification with total being. Now in the Buddhistic philosophy, which perhaps is a simpler presentation of it as we can find anywhere, uh, because at least of its familiarity to us more so than some of the less known schools of Eastern philosophy, we have this idea, therefore, of the attainment of Buddhahood. We have this uh, process of man gradually passing out of the cycle of rebirth, because egoism or mental individualism is at the root of rebirth. We find the individual, however, also passing into a state of what they would have termed, and did term, illumination. Now this illumination is the person moving into a state of internal awareness, which becomes more and more surviving and consistent, and brings greater and greater sense of internal uh, power. The consciousness of a universal life power beyond thought. This would be equivalent, of course, to Buddhahood, and the field of this, the great energy space field, covered by the second power of the Logos, or the second Logos, is, of course, the messianic field. It is the field of the principle of beauty. It is the field of the sphere of divine love. It is the positive pole of desire in desirelessness or compassion. And in the second power of the creating principle, we have the ultimate and final sublimation of man's concept of emotion and its restoration to its divine unity. Thus we have the idea of this returning home across the bridge. And Christ, as the embodiment of this principle, saying that none come unto the Father, save through the Son, or through this medium distance of the universal acceptance of the infinite love of God. So the end of wisdom, or the mental focus, is to discover deity as absolute reality, absolute law, absolute good, for that matter or intellectually, as absolute truth. But as we proceed to the second person, or ascend now above this, to the second power of the Trinity, we have to find the experience of consciousness as absolute love, absolute compassion. Because we are dealing now with a very intricate but very important equation. Man searching always, for escape from selfness, has discovered way down on the material plane of his action a principle, namely that the greatest power that can cause him to forget himself is to love something else. That by love he overcomes his own ego. That true love releases him from the tyranny of self-desire. In a strange way, true love also takes his mind away from its own mental focus. There is self-forgetfulness in the service of the beloved. Thus man finds a strange release, even temporarily and temporally, in pure love. Love as unselfish as he can conceive it to be. So he moves this concept into this great concept of the creative triad 
and finding his own consciousness on its pilgrimage or search toward the infinite, he tries to identify himself with the principle of formations, which is this principle of love. He also recognizes that in some mysterious way that this love is a bridge between existence as he knows it and the total absence of that existence. He does, suddenly discovers that absolute unification with consciousness can only result from total self-forgetfulness. That he can never discover the nature of ultimate being while he can remember himself. This is a peculiar point, but as he proceeds in his investigation, he discovers it to be true. He must therefore experience something that causes himself to become totally unimportant. And the only experience that he has found is some kind of a high emotional experience. And that this emotional experience in the term of sublimity causes him to have an absolute desire to participate in the nature of this sublimity. Therefore, through the ultimate and utter love of God, the individual achieves the means of final attainment of universality. He does it not by his wisdom, but by his, in, as the uh, St. Francis of Assisi expressed it, through this absolute passion for God. Now, in a strange way, uh, the terms probably are not so good. I don't think St. Francis actually meant passion as we know it. I think it was this infinite longing, this infinite desiring that transcends any loneliness of earth. Man finally lonely only for God. And therefore completely ready to obey. Completely selfless. Completely dedicated to the final uh, attainment of the absolute state in which all condition has died out. And it is only through this absolute unconditioned dying out of condition that the individual finally comes back to the first power of the Godhead, which is this strange eternal creativity. He experiences also that this eternal creativity this thing which he recognizes as the paternity of God. God, the infinite father-mother of all that lives. God, the infinite parent, infinitely loving its creation throughout infinity. Man, to reach God, must some way reach this. And must even perhaps pass through it into the great silence from which it comes. But he cannot attain this deity uh, consciousness without passing through this infinite love of deity for creation and the discovery that law, truth, wisdom, and love are all one thing. That they are degrees of the maturing of this infinite capacity for reunion with the infinite. So in the second polarization we have the bridge of the Christs, or the bridge of the Messiahs. Those who so greatly loved their world that they labored and died for it, and have become the symbols of the great renunciation of all worldly things in the service of their fellow men. This is also an essential part of your symbolism, for the love of creation for creation, the love of the great creating power for everything that it is fashioned, is absorbed into this creation to become the love of things for each other, and finally the love of all things for the Creator. So this tremendous power, this great potential, this great creative attribute, is also locked within creation. And the release of this attribute to its highest degree is the release of the second power of the triad. That which follows this 
the final union of the separated being with the great quietude, the great sleep, which is unconditioned consciousness itself, transcends description. No one has ever been able to express it except symbolically of the individual as a person in absolute faith and in absolute love like the small child going to sleep in God. What that sleep is, not knowing, but with a perfect faith that beyond the sleeping in the appointing of things is the waking which must always follow. But as man physically in this world, if he has lived a reasonable life, if he has kept faith, goes to sleep at the end of his days with a full inward conviction of the rightness of things. So in the infinite, that being which has learned to understand, learned to love, and learned to long for the creator from which it came, goes to sleep in consciousness, in space consciousness, with a perfect faith and a complete realization that this is going home that this is the return of the spark to the flame, that this is the return of the part to the whole, and that beyond this there is no night and there is no fear. Thus out of the principle of messianic faith or love comes also this infinite acceptance. For just as deity must be blaze forth in the fullness of all things, so man in searching for deity must arise to the realization of the fulfillment of all things, that everything is there. Everything is in its natural and proper place. So the individual spark, having been restored to its parent flame, sleeps again for seven eternities. And what lies beyond that sleep, man does not dare to speculate because he can think as he will, fabricate what he wants to, but he cannot know, because he cannot experience beyond his attainment. He can only realize that somewhere in the mystery of things, all these values and facts exist. So that actually man descends or ascends like Jacob and his ladder upon a staircase of seven levels. He ascends and descends upon a mysterious ladder which consists of the seven powers of God. And he is moving upward among these powers. And he has descended from among them. And he brought them all down into the sleep of material birth with him. And he brings them all back to the sleep of spiritual union with him. For at both ends is sleep. At one end the sleep of the earth, at the other end the sleep of heaven. And in between these two, a waking creature, passing through various degrees of waking, only finally to come in the end of things to the need for the great sleep. So as all potentials have been exhausted in perfection, so the individual seeks rest and repose. In the study, then, of these creative attributes and powers, we can begin to see why they should be variously symbolized. Now, in your Kabbalistic system, we have a great triad can say, consisting of Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sofair. Ain, the boundless. Ain Sof, the boundless light. Ain Sofair, the boundless light. Eternity, eternal life, eternal light. These are the powers. Eternity forever existing is the first person. The, cre the consciousness per se. Eternal life is the eternal motion. Two a long radius from circumference to center and from center to circumference. And aim so fair, boundless light is the bursting forth of mind by means of which all the mystery is illuminated up so far as mind can go. Out of this moves the great order of structure. And in the Old Testament it is presented to us as the seven days of creation. And this seven days of creation represent the descent of light on its involutionary arc 
and the ascent of life on its evolutionary arc, counting or constituting 14 periods, which are represented in India by 14 Manus, or teachers. The seventh day, the mysterious day of rest, the Sabbath, represents ascending, ultimate union with consciousness, descending the rest of death. Therefore, when the time came for Moses to die, the Lord had promised him that he would not send to him the angel of death. Therefore, the Lord came himself and gave Moses the kiss of sleep, and he went to sleep in the hills of Moab. But till downward, the rest is the silence that comes at the base of the great involutionary arc, for in this silence sleeps the mineral with its consciousness locked in darkness. At the top, eternal consciousness, its own nature, dark to us because we cannot understand it, and immovable, unchangeable. Between these two, the great ladder extends its rounds and rounds. A man descending comes finally to the darkness of matter and ascending to the equally impenetrable darkness of total consciousness. And in this arc between, he passes through all the conditioned states that we know. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva represents exactly the same principle as far as these situations are concerned. And in all the systems we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or their equivalents, always signifying the three spheres. And out of the third sphere emanating the great quaternary, or the hollow square of the world. We have in Bacon's New Atlantis the College of the Six Days Work, in which man, by attainment, ascends the scala intellectus, or the ladder of the intellect, finally coming to the great silence, which is the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord. We also have it in the Rosicrucians in the Silentum Post Clamoris, or the silence that ends all things, and in Bami likewise. For behind and beneath all things we find being eternal, the great silence, from which all the sound comes and into which all the sound must return again. So we have the sound and the fury as far as objectivity is concerned. But this strange life of ours is rounded with a sleep. And not only the sleep below, but the sleep above. And all of it takes place within the great circle of consciousness, which is to man total sleep. And within sleep, these wakings come. These dreams exist. And in this sleep, what dreams may come. And we would always have to think of ourselves perhaps, as dreamers slowly awakening. And when we awaken from the dream, we do not know what kind of a world we will live in. But we do believe firmly that at the end of the great evolutionary dream is the ultimate union with reality, the ultimate outgrowing of all conditioned existence, the ascent of the numbers, as Pythagoras taught, this mysterious pyramid of numbers called the Tetractus which finally ends again in the one, the one in turn finally disappearing into totality. So man is now fighting to escape the concept of one as the first and regain his understanding of one as the all. To do this, he must transcend the one in himself and attain to the all, which is the only one. This is also your... The Sankara philosophy in India. It is the principle behind this great philosophical system. So man grows up and down through the seven creating principles, or the seven powers of God. And in various ways, these powers have been embodied, personified. Attributes have been given to them. But in every religion, your idol is only a picture of an ideal. And there are very few truly idolatrous people. What we call, therefore, these symbols of gods and deities are really efforts to create pictures which will cause thought, 
which will explain in some way, upon some level, ideas substantially too abstract to be understood. When we begin to recognize this, we will realize that the seven great gods of the ancients, like the seven wonders of the world, are all symbols of the seven powers of the Godhead. And that within these powers we live and move and have our being at all times. And that every condition through which we pass is a conditioned state of these powers. That beyond these powers there is not anything else. There is not even vacuum. For what we call vacuum is merely the totality of these powers in an undifferentiated state. And that we are moving in a strange way, from unknowing to self-knowing to universal knowing to unknowing. And at the end, we pass back into a state which we can neither define nor estimate. But in the great theater of existence through which we pass, everything we work with, the chair, the table, the book, the person, the invention, the music, uh, the most simple device, the soap, the wood, the paper, all these things have no existence and no substance apart from various compounds of cosmic energies. Just as surely as we can reduce every physical substance to its electrons and ions, just as surely as we know that the new hat we bought for Easter is actually an energy, a condition in energy, which incidentally, psycholo psychologically, was very energizing to us at that moment also. <laughs> that all these things are energy. But more than this, these things are forms. They are forms of some kind. And every form that exists is a combination in various levels of action or relationship of the seven creative powers of God. Therefore, there is no such a thing as a profane world, and there never can be. There is no difference between things sacred and things not sacred, except in human acceptance or rejection. Everything is equally divine. Whether it be the mysterious deity we worship in space, or the little dog we pat on the head. These things are all God unfolding. And therefore... We have a deep and wonderful responsibility to life. And it is our privilege, as best we can and as rapidly as our own beings permit, to become increasingly aware of this truth. And by becoming aware of it, break the mysterious, magical spell of the ego, which binds us to the concept that there is ourselves and something else when there really is not something else. An ancient Chinese teacher was brought before a vast group of people and began a speech. And uh, he opened his remarks by saying, And you, my dear friend. In other words, he spoke to 10,000 people, but he referred to them as one friend, trying to point out the union in them. He was not speaking to many people, but to one person. He probably could have gone further and included himself among them. But perhaps it was a difficulty in language. But his concept was that he was not speaking to many, but to one in many appearances. In the universe, we have not many things. We have one thing manifesting primarily through seven powers and proceeding or emanating from this to infinite diversity. But regardless of all that diversity, the great framework stands. There is one which becomes seven. There are seven which become one. And even this becoming belongs to thought only because the one and the seven were always identical. And the seven, attempting to become one, have always been one. So that the attainment is the discovery of the fact, and not 
the establishment of a new or different condition. If we can carry those thoughts in mind, we probably will have enough to think about for this coming week. Now, we have two...